up now with the process of decoding genetic information through transcribing DNA into messenger RNA or mRNA and then the translation of that mRNA into protein. So we'll study these processes in some detail, but let's first establish um, the nature of the genetic code. So we're going to be studying in detail the processes by which DNA is transcribed into RNA, and that transcription process involves the uh, DNA-directed synthesis of RNA. And only one template strand of DNA is used. So if this is a double helix of DNA, in order to produce RNA, the two strands of DNA need to be separated, and only one of these is used to read um, in a process of transcription to produce a messenger RNA. So only one of the two strands of DNA actually encodes information. The other one is there to provide information in case a one strand of DNA gets damaged, then the information present on the other strand can be used to repair that damage by DNA synthesis. So again, only one of the two strands, the template strand of, of DNA, is transcribed into messenger RNA. And of course, we know that there are differences between DNA and RNA, one difference being that the nitrogenous, ba the nitrogenous bases found in the nucleotides of RNA um, are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil, not thymine, as in the nucleotide precursors to DNA. Another difference is, is that in DNA, the ribosugars of the nucleotides that's the end base. The ribosugars of the nucleotides, the two prime carbon, this would be the one prime carbon, the two prime carbon, the three prime carbon, the four prime carbon, the five prime carbon, and then this would be the phosphate out here. The two prime carbon lacks a um, uh, hydroxyl group and contains only a hydrogen, whereas the three prime carbon has an OH. This is in DNA. And this, is, this represents then a deoxyribonucleotide. But you'll remember that in RNA, if we look at the nucleotides of RNA, found in RNA, the nitrogenous base, which can be A, G, C, or U, where the nitrogenous bases here are A, T, G or C. Uh, in RNA, the two prime carbon contains a hydroxyl group. So both the two prime and the three prime carbon in RNA contain um, a hydroxyl group. Here's one, sec two prime carbon, three prime carbon, four prime carbon, five prime carbon, and then O, P, and so on. So those are the two main differences between DNA and RNA, and that's just by way of review. So um, we produce then, when DNA is transcribed, we produce a messenger RNA that is going to be used in translation to direct the synthesis of polypeptides. And all polypeptides are, are amino acids, amino acid 1, amino acid 2, amino acid 3, etc., linked together. That is what a polypeptide is. And so the information in DNA then is transcribed into information that is present in mRNA that then directs the synthesis of a particular sequence of amino acids. And each amino acid at any one of the positions of a protein can be one of the 20 possible amino acids that are available. So mRNA then is used in translation to synthesize polypeptides, and this all takes place on the ribosome, which is a ribonucleoprotein complex that we'll consider in some detail. And the translation process in addition to requiring mRNA, so messenger RNA is used in the translation process, that messenger RNA contains the information that will direct the synthesis of particular amino acid sequences, as we shall see. There are also two other kinds of RNA used in translation. There is transfer RNA, which serves as an adapter, as we will see. I'm kind of giving you a preview of where we're going. tRNA is adapter between the messenger RNA and amino acids. So that will link the information present in mRNA is read by tRNA and amino acids are carried by the transfer RNA. tRNA stands for transfer RNA. So we will see the adapter role of tRNA in great detail. And then ribosomal or R 
RNA is a functional component of the ribosome, and the heart of the ribosome is actually composed of ribosomal RNA. Now, of course, both tRNA and RNA are transcribed from genes, just as messenger RNA is transcribed from genes. And what we will now, now that we've previewed this process, we will consider it in some detail. So let's consider the um, transcription of, of RNA from DNA. And we've talked about messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA. But there are also some other kinds of RNA. SNRNA stands for small nuclear RNA. So we have small nuclear RNA. And these RNAs are very important in eukaryotes in uh, the process of pro in the process of splicing together messenger RNA components, as we will see. So these are what we will call splicing components. We'll study those in some detail. There is also signal recognition particle RNA that is part of, an, of a ribonucleoprotein complex involved in making sure that in eukaryotes and prokaryotes, for that matter, that the that proteins destined for secretion will run through the appropriate cellular machinery for secretion. So we're going to consider that in some detail as well. This has to do with protein secretion. And we'll study its role there. And then microRNAs, or miRNAs, are fairly recent discovery. In the past decade, really, their role has been established. And they, they provide a gene regulation role, as we will see. So they are regulatory in nature, and we'll study those as well. And now let's address the actual code. And the nature of the code was first worked out, really, by Francis Crick. You'll remember him as one of the co-discoverers of the structure of DNA, and another British biologist, Sidney Brenner. And they determined the nature of the, the genetic code, the way in which nucleotides specify amino acid order in uh, proteins. So they actually then figured out the, the nature of the genetic code. And they, uh, they discovered that a codon is a block of three DNA nucleotides. So a sequence of three DNA nucleotides, which of course at any position can be either A, uh, T, G, or C at position one, two, or three. And it is those, those the order of those nucleotides and the, and the nitrogenous bases that they contain that determines a, what a corresponding amino acid will be inserted into a protein. So for every three nucleotides in DNA, let's make sure that we get this down, we have a codon of DNA which corresponds to three nucleotides, and that is read into three nucleotides. This is DNA. We have three nucleotides of RNA, messenger RNA, and those three nucleotides are read into one amino acid in protein. So three nucleotides, which is, defines a codon, specifies one amino acid in a protein. And um, the way that they discovered this triplet code, the, the three nucleotide codon, in other words, the triplet code, is that they introduced, they took a genetic approach in a bacterial virus, and they introduced mutations um, which consisted of single nucleotide insertions or deletions, and they looked for mutations that disrupted protein synthesis or the production of proteins in a very particular way, in ways which produced frame shifts in the reading of the genetic code. So we'll see what that is in a moment. And they then discovered the importance of the reading frame of messenger RNAs, ultimately produced, of course, by transcription of DNA, in the production of functional proteins. So let's look at how they went about this and look at their um, very elegant experiments. So they could mutagenize their bacterial viruses with particular chemical mutagens that would cause the deletion of single bases in a uh, DNA sequence um, or the insertion of single bases in a DNA sequence. That was, that was the particular type of mutagen that favored that type of mutation, insertion or deletion of one base. Let's consider what would happen if we deleted one base here. So here's our, our um, RNA sequence that would, of course, be transcribed from a DNA sequence. Here we see the RNA, the messenger RNA, which contains 
uracil containing nitrogen spaces instead of thymidine uh, containing nitrogen spaces. But ultimately, you realize that the mutations that we're going to be talking about occur in the DNA, which produces then mutant RNAs. So here is our wild type or normal sequence of nucleotides in an RNA produced by a normal gene. And the amino acid sequence encoded by this sequence is, um, by this RNA is methionine, proline, threonine, histidine, arginine, spartate, alanine, and serine. So what would happen if they deleted a single base? Well, they would notice that when they did that, that they still got protein out that does not, did not disrupt protein synthesis completely, but rather the sense of the protein was disrupted. So at a point downstream or at the point of the mutation, the amino acid sequence of the resulting protein was changed. And, um, but upstream, that is, um, before that insertion of that, or deletion or insertion of a single base, in this case deletion, the sequence of amino acids in the protein was normal or was wild type. It was only at the point of deletion or insertion and thereafter, downstream, that the um, protein was, was um, different in its amino acid sequence. And they called this type of mutation a frame shift mutation. This is a frame shift mutation. So because the reading frame has, of the messenger RNA has been changed, let's illustrate that with an analogy. So we're going to illustrate that with an English language analogy. And just like the, the code of RNA or of DNA is a digital code, the, co the code of a, the written English language, for example, is a digital code. So let's take a sentence. A, consisting of a three-letter code, just like um, the codons are a three-letter code. So let's say the fat cat sat. This has meaning for us and specifies a particular meaning for us because each of these letters uh, are, are, the order of these letters um, are read in a particular way. It's a triplet code, if you will, for this sentence. Well, let's ask what would happen if we deleted one of these letters. Let's delete, um, for example, E here. So then we would have a triplet code which read as follows. THF, and then ATC, and then ATS, AT. This sentence doesn't make any sense to us, and in fact, the point at which it is disrupted is the point at which we have deleted a letter. Likewise, what would happen if we deleted two letters? Well, we, let's say let's delete not only E, but let's delete uh, A as well. So now we'll read what this would, this would be transformed into if we deleted two bases. Here we deleted one base. So here we would have T, H, we're missing E, so we go directly to F again, but we're now missing A. So the next letter would be T here, then C, then A, then T, then S, then A, and then T. So again, we have nonsense. This doesn't make any sense to us. But now let's look at what would happen if we deleted three letters, let's say. So now we're going to delete three letters, minus three. Here we had minus two and here we had minus one. Then we would have THF, and now we're missing both A and T. So we start CAT and SAT. That is to say we've restored sense of our of our sentence if we delete three letters everywhere downstream of the third deletion, and we're talking about deleting here, if we've deleted uh, three, then we restore sense again. Our reading frame has been shifted back to a, a, a sentence which now makes sense. And that is exactly what Brenner and Crick discovered, is that if three bases are deleted, then um, after the third deletion, the amino acids are restored to a wild type. So if we deleted three right here, 
these three, then we would be missing the amino acid threonine in our sequence, but our reading frame would be restored to wild type. Here we have histidine, arginine, spartate, alanine, and serine. Um, and here we have methionine and proline. So we're missing an amino acid due to the deletion of three bases, but the rest of the sequence is produced intact in, as, in a sensical way, in such a way that we can deduce then that the genetic code is a triplet code, that the genetic code in RNA, to ultimately derive from DNA, is read into protein sequences by reading three nucleotides, three nucleotides, three nucleotides, specifying one amino acid. And this is the nature of their approach. And I want to draw your attention to the power of a genetic approach here. You'll be hearing me talk more about this. And we've, um, we've, uh, covered, we've mentioned it before, but now we're going to really emphasize it. By obtaining mutations, the process by which the genetic code is read was deduced. And without mutations, it would be very difficult to discover this by, simply by biochemistry. So the power of getting mutations that disrupt a process allows biologists to dissect that process and understand what that process is. It's much like if you were to, wanted to discover how a, a, an engine worked and you didn't know how it worked. If you could remove single components one at a time, that is, create a mutation, uh, you could ask how that disrupted the process of that, that engine or that motor functioning. And then you could disrupt another uh, component of that engine and ask how disrupting that component disrupted engine function. And little by little you could put together how the how the process in fact worked. So that is the power of a genetic approach and we'll be talking more about that uh, as the course goes along. Now let's uh, talk about uh, Marshall Nuremberg's discovery of the actual genetic code. Given that it was a triplet code, how is it how is this triplet code read and which codons, which order of nucleotides specify which amino acids? Well, if we have a triplet code and there are positions one, two, and three, and at any of these positions of, of a codon, in other words, this defines a single codon. This is a single codon. At every one of these positions, we could have a or G or T or U, if it's an RNA that we're talking about, of course, ultimately derived from a DNA sequence. Um, and here we could have A, G, T or U. And at position three, we could have A, G, T or U. The question becomes, how many different arrangements of these nucleotides could we have, um, that is, how many different codons could be specified, given that we have four possible nitrogenous bases found in the nucleotides of RNA. So the way to deduce that is to say, well, we could draw them all out, all the possible combinations, but that would take us a while. So what we have are four possible nucleotides containing each of the four possible nitrogenous bases at each of three different positions. And that tells us that we have four to the third possible combinations of those nucleotides, which equals four times four four times four equals 64 possible codons. And that's interesting because there are only 20 possible amino acids that are found in proteins. And that means that our amino acid code is degenerate. That doesn't mean that it goes around exposing itself. That means that in fact there are more than one codon that can specify particular amino acids because we have an, a vast excess of codons. Parenthetically speaking, it's interesting that if it were a doublet code, there are only two amino acids, uh, I'm sorry, two nucleotides that specified a single amino acid. If there were two nucleotides that specified one amino acid, we would have too few codons because then we would have four possible codons, uh, four possible nitrogenous bases, excuse me, at each of two positions, and that only equals 16 possible codons, yet there are 20 amino acids. So a doublet code would not be possible, but a triplet code is the minimum code you would need to specify 20 possible amino acids. 
And indeed, it is a triplet code as deduced by Watson and Crick, but that leads to an excess of codons relative to amino acids. And that means there are um, more than one codon for some amino acids. Some amino acids are specified by more than one codon. And that's what we mean by degeneracy. The code is degenerate. Now this codon, the AUG codon, is very specific and that always indicates the beginning of translation. So this is a translation start. When the messenger RNA is going to be read, an AUG codon marks the start of translation. And AUG encodes a particular amino acid, methionine, uh, a modified methionine in the case of prokaryotes, as we will see, but a methionine nonetheless. So that's the um, elements of the code. And here is, in fact, the genetic code. And you can see that using this code table, we can decipher the particular codons that specify particular amino acids. So the first, if the first letter is U, and the second letter is U in this row up here, and the third letter is U over here, we, can, we have UUU, that specifies the amino acid phenylalanine. Here we have a single codon, excuse me, AUG, which specifies methionine. So AUG here specifies methionine, and there is only one codon that specifies methionine. Uh, leucine is specified by six possible codons. And um, there are other ones. Serine is specified by two here and four here, also six possible codons. Um, glutamate is specified by, glutamic acid is specified by two possible codons. So we have different possible uh, for different amino acids, there are different numbers of codons that specify the insertion of that particular amino acid in a growing protein chain. Notice that there are uh, three stop codons, UGA, UAA, and UAG, that signify to the translational apparatus on the ribosome to stop translating the messenger RNA into protein. And they indicate then the cessation of protein synthesis and the end of a growing protein chain. So protein translation is stopped when these codons are encountered um, as the messenger RNA is read into protein. So we have three different stop codons. And this, interestingly, very interestingly in fact, this genetic code, the actual meaning of the letters, the chemical letters of DNA and then the RNA that is transcribed from DNA, the meaning is conserved broadly in evolution. The code is almost universal. There are some minor differences in some of the in some um, organisms, some protists, for example, and in mitochondria and chloroplasts, which after all have their own DNA and their own ribosomes, and therefore are, translate their own messenger RNAs into protein. There are some minor differences, but essentially speaking, the genetic code is universal. And that points to a common kinship of all life on Earth and our common evolutionary origin from an ancient chemical ancestor and an ancient cell um, early in the development of life. We are all kin on Earth, evolutionarily speaking, of course. We all derive from co a common ancestor in the deep mists of time. And that is revealed to us um, uh, profoundly by the universal genetic code that exists. And so as an example, um, let's look at um, the advances in genetic engineering that are made possible by that universal genetic code. So although there are some minor differences in the code, we can, for example, engineer organisms that have a jellyfish gene. In this case, this pig has a, a gene that encodes a fluorescent protein. Um, this pig does not have that protein in it. And that jellyfish gene from a jellyfish, very distantly related to a mammal, that gene functions perfectly normally in a mammal and produces a pig that fluoresces uh, yellow. And there are other examples. Here is a fruit fly that has been transformed with a green fluorescing jellyfish gene that encodes the green fluorescent protein. And that is expressed perfectly normally in a fruit fly, in an insect. Here are Here's a mouse expressing a green fluorescent protein from a jellyfish. Again, the jellyfish gene is functioning perfectly normally in a mouse to produce functional green fluorescent protein, and that is based on the universal genetic code. 
And here, in fact, are monkeys that are fluorescing green due to expressing that same green fluorescent protein derived from jellyfish. The code, in other words, the, universe, the genetic code is universal and again points to our common ancestry of the common ancestry of all living things and allows us to express genes from one organism in another organism which has permitted great advances in genetic engineering. Um, modern pharmacology and agriculture that uses genetic engineering would be impossible if we did not have a universal genetic code. So that is where we'll pick up with in the next part of this lecture. We will move into looking at the transcription process in prokaryotes before considering the transcription process in eukaryotes. And along the way, we'll be comparing the transcription processes between these two groups of organisms. And that's what we'll pick up with then in the next part of this.